Senator Peterson, you got a question? Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Senator Mizell, again, you mentioned the, uh, the first set of amendments, uh, Senate committee amendments, mm -hmm. uh, the committee Jude A be rejected. Can you hit what those amendments do again? Uh, those amendments, as I recall, allowed the legislature to, at some point in time, with this on the ballot being passed, the legislature could then add exceptions as they saw fit at some point in the future. And when you say exceptions, what does the exceptions mean? Bro you, you, that's broad. What do you mean by exceptions? The exceptions would be in the case of rape or incest, as I understand it. I see that you didn't sign the uh, report. Is there a reason why? I, I, I really didn't sign it because I agreed with the vote on the floor in the Senate on the date change. Okay, I didn't know if it was the exceptions or the date change. So you would prefer that it be held in 2019 and the other five conferees wanted it to be held in 2020. Okay, but back to the exceptions. That's not something that you oppose. No, the exceptions were, I, I really leaned with the thoughts of the author on this. I just signed because there was a point where I uh, had difficulty with it. So you're telling me that the author agreed that the amendment that would not permit for exceptions for rape or incest, she agreed with this version of the bill? You'd have to bring that up with her. I just see her signature on the, on the thing. Okay, that's fair. And I just want to, okay, I think I understand you correctly. The Senate amendments permitted for, even if the constitutional amendment passed, permitted for the legislature to come back later to offer exceptions specifically, this is one of possible other exceptions, of course, it's broad, but for rape or incest of a child, and they would not be forced to have, an, they would not be uh, forced to have the child, and that an abortion would be permitted in the case of rape or incest. That won't be permitted statutorily if the constitutional amendment passes. At, at this point in time, it's not included as a provision in this bill. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean it's, if we're moving this to 2020, there are times to make adjustments as, as the bill becomes effective, I would think. And th th I'm just saying, if, we, if, if we're voting to bring this to the ballot, to the people, mm -hmm. then we can always vote to make adjustments after we have it in place. The exceptions, the exceptions weren't going to be on the ballot this year. Mm -hmm. We were going to vote for the, for the exceptions after the, the bill became effective. So it was, it was uh, as I understood it, I wasn't in committee when that came up, but my understanding was that the exceptions were something the legislature could do at some point in the future, given the thought that this would pass. Didn't have to be done simultaneously. Well, I, I certainly understand that it may be, I guess, the five conferees that signed opinion that you wouldn't include the opportunity for exceptions now, but why pass the bill if you don't address exceptions right now? Everybody has, this is such a personal thing, Senator Peterson, everybody has their own interpretation, and I believe everybody sees this as a step that they want the state to take. The, the, all the uh, side issues and I understand it between the date and the exceptions. I'm not talking. I'm not talking about the date right now. I'm only talking, talking about the about exceptions for rape or incest. The exceptions are not in this bill, and so this would be a constitutional amendment that doesn't permit for rape or incest exceptions. The intent of the constitutional amendment was strictly, strictly said to include in the state constitution there would be a prohibition against abortion. There, there, there was no space in that thought to put all the, all the other exceptions and, and secondary issues. So, so really, from day one, the author's intent was just to say that the, in the state of Louisiana, the constitution would not allow abortion as a right within that constitution. So that's why I think most people 
most people are comfortable knowing that that is something that once we get that in the Constitution, then uh, all the other parts could be ironed out. Who are most people? Apparently most people who signed this. That's five of four million. I can't speak. The state is going to be able to vote on this in the fall, and this is the right of the state to be able to take that vote. Yeah, but uh, when you say most people, most people think that it's okay to pass this bill in this legislature with 39 people, but that's not reflective of most people. I mean, when we say we're, you know, let's just say these, right. those are the people that signed the conference meeting, and everybody's vote will be accounted for. I understand that. This is an incredibly individual thing. I mean, I think the five, the six signers on this document each have their own set of, uh, I can go this far, I can go no further. Or this is an absolute, this is an absolute requirement in the way I see my conscience on this. So, so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's really, it, when you say most people, I don't know if you can get uh, most people to agree on all the components of this at any one time, especially until it's decided by the state. Senator, could I shall just take a little recess for I need to do a procedural thing to get done because the House is getting ready to go on a recess. I'll come right back to where you sure. all are. If Thank you, you Mr. President. Let's put, it on, let's put this on the side for just a second. I'll return you back on the instant replay where you were. So, uh, Mr. Uh, Secretary? I need House Bill 3. Senator Morrell now moves that the, uh, that the Senate adopt a motion to allow the Senate to consider House Bill Number 3 on third reading and final passage af after 6, 6 o'clock p.m. on the 57th calendar day pursuant to the consent of the House. Remember, that is the omnibus bond bill. The House is getting ready to... Uh, to leave for the afternoon, we need to get this over to them with your permission. Senator Morrell now moves to uh, ask a two-thirds vote for, of the Senate, likewise of, of the House of Representatives, and uh, pursuant to the Constitution to allow for this bill to be heard uh, later today. Uh, when the machine's open, those of you in favor will vote yes, those opposed no. Secretary, vote your machines, please. Vote your machines, please. Vote your machines. Senator Hewitt, yes. Senator Cortez, yes. All right, close them up. 38 yeas, no nays. The motion uh, passes. All right, uh, ladies, if y'all mind getting back to your positions. Senator Pearson, you got a question? Come on in. Two. Senator Long. Two. Nice. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, so. Just, you know, we just went through this um, debate on another bill. It wasn't a constitutional amendment, as you know. Right. Um, and in this bill, the issue will be on the ballot, whether it's like now it's going to be 20 if the bill passes. I guess the real concern I have is if, if you're telling me that the rejection of the Senate amendments, which permitted for an exception, can, those issues can be addressed later. Why can't the entirety of the issue be addressed later? What is the rush? Because the whole thing of the constitutional amendment, it says that it's only going to be effective if Roe v. Wade is overturned. Is that right? That, that's my understanding, but I, I believe there was some concerns with what was happening in other states. Now we care about what's happening in other states. I thought everybody wanted to tell me that this is Louisiana and we shouldn't be worried about what's happening in other states. So now we're concerned. So really, this is a bill about following other states to help undermine Roe v. Wade? This is strictly a bill that says that Louisiana is a pro-life state. The, uh, the fact that other states have made that less than uh, what we would expect to see happen. I mean, right now, I, I, the intent of this bill is strictly to, to codify in the state's constitution that Louisiana is a pro-life state, and I think the urgency is because of what other states are doing. I, I agree with you. Louisiana is unique, and, and nobody questions that. Uh, th there's a lot of ways of looking at this. But in a very straightforward, simple way, it all comes down to the fact that the majority of people, I've heard it said by people who are against this bill, that they 
probably feel that the majority of people in Louisiana are pro-life. This, this puts it into the Constitution that Louisiana is pro-life and that gives some security to anything jeopardizing that from any direction, frankly. Who decided that Louisiana was pro-life and where did that designation and brand come from? I, I don't call it a brand, but I think the majority of people, I, I, don't, I don't do the polling, but I'm, most of the polling that I've seen shows a shift uh, I think, and you can blame it on ultrasound, whatever, whatever has made people have more of a pro-life open mind has taken place and Louisiana has felt the impact of that. Okay, so what poll are you citing? Because there are polls that I've seen that say people don't want a strict abortion bill passed in this state without exceptions, particularly for rape and incest. Those are the polls that I see that a majority of not just Louisianians, but Americans across this country don't want even if they are pro-life, whether it's Donald Trump, the President of the United States, Ronald Reagan, the former President, whether it's Kathleen Babineau Blanco, former Governor, or whether it's former Governor Buddy Romer, all of them have said that exceptions for rape or incest is what is the line, and that if anything short of that is egregious and inhumane. So why are you saying that this bill reflects the majority of Louisianians? Because I've not seen one poll that says we should pass a bill that doesn't have an exception for rape or incest. What's the poll? Please cite it because you've said twice that Louisiana is a pro-life state and people say that but I want to understand what the basis is and what is the poll? I, I couldn't tell you the name of the poll, Senator Peterson, but why do we say things if we can't back it up with data? I can go sit at my desk and go to my phone or my computer and bring up a poll. We can bring the bill but, back. But we can bring the bill back and go do that and we can do that and we can come back and we can have a debate about something about respecting women. Women should be able to do what they want with their own bodies. And if we're not going to have facts, we should not just pass a bill without facts. Too often we come up here and don't provide the facts. I don't see us ever vote on a bill based on a poll. We vote on a I bill. I didn't cite a poll. I didn't cite. I didn't you cite. That Louisiana excuse was me. Life. Excuse me. I've got the mic. Yep. I don't vote based on checking a poll. I vote on what my belief system has me vote for. That's okay. That's fair. The belief system in Louisiana, and maybe it's my circle and your circle, and we all have our circle of influence. But my belief system tells me that this is what I would vote for, and those who I, I, I hear most from are those I see. It's all of us. It's the same reason we are a pro crime, you know, pro law enforcement, or we're more open minded on crime. We each have our realm of influence. My realm of influence strongly supports pro life. So it doesn't take a poll. I, I don't. I think okay. we've already voted. We've already said this was a good idea. The fact that they've taken amendments off doesn't change my support of the bill. I, I would prefer the bill to have included the date that we had on it in the Senate. But with that being said, the the author has signed off. The other members of the conference committee have signed off. I'm going to sign off because I want this bill to go through. And I, I believe there is room. But you didn't sign it. I didn't sign it because I wanted the original date. Okay, but you also said that Louisiana is pro-life, and that you also and you also said that we're doing this to follow other states. You said that. No, I did it because other states have done things to to threaten the uh, Constitution's interpretation of abortion. That is why Louisiana has felt it necessary because of the extreme measures taken by other states to put in our constitution that we are a pro-life state and the right of abortion is prohibited in the state of Louisiana. With that being the primary point of what we're trying to accomplish, the secondary questions you're bringing up with any exceptions would, would still be up for discussion at another time. They don't have to be part of this. They're not going to be on the ballot in the fall or of, of 2020 when this comes up anyway. 
they're not secondary, they're primary questions. And then secondly, if we don't need to do those issues, which are primary issues when it comes to women's bodies and whether or not they're exceptions, why do we need the bill this year? Let's do it next year, because you can still put it on the ballot in 2020, since we're not doing this year. What's the urgency? Why wouldn't we get it right? And why wouldn't we protect women who are raped or victims and traumatized by incest to make sure that they get the health care that they need and they can take care of their bodies? And they're not required to carry the baby of a rapist. Why wouldn't we make sure of that before we pass a bill that doesn't have any imp impact until 2020? Why do we have to do it today? You're telling me that none of it's going to be impacted until next fall. I'm, I'm telling you the date on the bill allows for it to be on the ballot in 2020. The vote we took allows for passage of it with these corrected changes. I'm telling you that the conference committee has agreed to remove those amendments that would have the exception and to allow for the amendment with the new date. That's, that's what I'm here to say, and, and we can vote on it. It does not change the intent to put the bill on the ballot and have the citizens of Louisiana decide if this would be part of our Constitution. I understand, but what you've said is inconsistent. You said that these are secondary issues, but they're, do you think they are important issues, whether or not there's an exception for rape or incest? Do you think they're important, whether primary or secondary? Do you think they're important, whether or not the woman who has been raped has the ability to have an abortion? What I said was, there's not, that was not going to be on the ballot. What is going to be on the ballot language is in the bill strictly to say that the Constitution of Louisiana would prohibit abortion. It would not have the exceptions on the ballot anyway. It, there, I, I don't believe I said it was secondary. I said it would not be in the ballot. It would not be on the ballot language. So that's something that could be determined at some point anyway. What we're determining today is if we're going to let the vote on the bill that we've already just decided was worthy of our vote, go forward with the uh, recommendations of the conference committee changing the date and removing the exceptions. That's what we're citing today. So what you said is that there were primary issues and that those other issues were not primary. You did say that. And then secondly, if it's not so important and we can deal with it later, why are we rejecting those amendments? I never said it was unimportant. It was not unimportant. So it so if it's, not, if it's not unimportant, it's important. It, there's only so much room on the ballot. It's not going to be on the ballot. So now, because we don't have enough room on the ballot, we can't lay out the language that impacts women's bodies. The ballot is strictly, if you looked at the bill, the ballot is very clearly to say that abortion would be prohibited in the Constitution of the state of Louisiana. I don't have the, that's, that's the point of what we're looking at. That, this is why the other points were amendments. They were added to that. They, they, they change the date and they change the ability after passage of that law to look at the exceptions. But those exceptions depend on the passage of the primary law going into the Constitution to begin with. But what, if the Constitution, the Roe v. Wade is already the law, and it's, that's the, the cons, what's constitutional, why are we in a rush to do in Louisiana, un, try to say, if something, if Roe v. Wade is undone, then we're going to do, we're going to say it's unconstitutional in Louisiana. And it's not until 2020. So what's the rush for this bill? And the fact that you're rejecting the amendments that we both agree now are not unimportant, which I will infer from that, that means they're important. The amendments were put on co in committee. The, yeah. the amendments were thought out. They were, they were obviously important enough to be put on in committee. Right. Right. I believe every amendment, whether I like them or not, has some importance and value because someone put some thought into the effect of that amendment on that bill. I get that. I, I get that. Whether I agree with it as being a good idea is totally different from whether it's important. Okay? Okay. I think I understand now. So the, it, you think that the amendments that were put on in the Senate committee that this commit, conference committee report is rejecting now were not, that's not some, the amendments that you are in favor of? 
the amendment that was put on change in the date is the one I'm not in favor. Okay. I'm only talking about the ones with the exceptions. Are you supportive of the amendment that has ex that had the exceptions? I, uh, well, I, uh, that's something I'm open to. I, I, I'm going to tell you, as a woman, I, I'm totally pro-life. We, we hear horrible scenarios that I'm compassionate about, and I, I appreciate the heartfelt feelings as a woman. You know, I, I have dear pro-life friends who, and I'm, I'm going to be, I'm talking to Karen, okay? And I'm talking to Beth. Okay. And I'm talking about I, I, Okay. And I'm going to tell you, it, it's hard for me to imagine a 12-year-old who needs an abortion. That, that right there is hard for me, to think a 12-year-old would need an abortion. But in my heart of hearts, I know the idea that we've come to think that's an acceptable option breaks my heart. It breaks my heart that we think we want that child to have an abortion. That, it, it, it's, it's, it's not, I don't think, but no, I'm, I have a hard time with it. But, and did you know that I have, but I, in all, I, I am pro-life, I believe we are pro-life. I, I don't believe we, we have abortion here because of those exceptions. If you look at the numbers of people having abortions, it's convenience abortions. It's all the different reasons, and then we, I, I can hear it, any bill we talk about, I can hear nightmare stories that, that uh, support an argument, but the nightmare stories aren't the normal reason that that's taken place. The normal reason it's taken place is, is because of, of conveniences or uh, economics or school semesters or whatever. So it's, it's, it, the compassion lies with the 12-year-old that you're describing, but that's not the reality. So, so let me ask you a couple of questions because you brought up a lot in just that last comment. The 12 year olds, the economics, the school semesters, there, I can make a, have some questions about each one of those. Let's start with the 12 year olds. The 12 year old has been raped and traumatized. What you're saying is that you're okay with this form of the bill, because we, but we haven't addressed the exceptions, nor did we in the other bill by Senator Milkovich. And so you're okay with a 12-year-old, let me not say 12, let's go to 10, because there are actually incidents of this. The 10-year-old getting, who is raped and now pregnant, you're okay with them not being able to work with their doctor, with their parent and their doctor, and being forced, this is forced birth. Forced birth, because once they're raped and once they're impregnated, our laws say forced birth. You're okay with that. No, and don't put words in my mouth telling I'm me I'm okay with it. But I, I, I think we need to reel this way back. My, my name is not on this bill. Representative Jackson's name on it. I'm, I, I'm handling it, but, but I'm, I'm, I don't want to answer. I'm answering for me. And I, I, I feel that we've got to respect what she wanted done on this bill. And what she wanted done is the, no, we the will of, well, we don't have to respect Representative Jackson's version of the bill. We have to debate Representative Jackson's version of the bill. And if you don't agree with it, I respect that. We have differences of opinion. We know that. But I respect that. But maybe someone else, if you don't believe in this bill, maybe you shouldn't handle it, nor should you vote for it. No, I 100% believe in the bill. Okay. But I'm saying that she wants it in the, in the form the conference committee is now. And, and that's what I'm here to present, is the bill in the form the conference committee is now. Okay, so you are okay with the rejection of the Senate amendments that don't provide for exceptions for rape or incest of the woman? That's what the bill does right now. That's what the bill does right now. Can't ignore the facts. At this point, yes. You're okay with that? <laughs> Thank you, Senator Miser. All right. Senator Peterson, you, you want to speak? Thank you, Mr. President. Um, 
So I'm not here to talk about the death penalty. I'm here to talk about uh, abortion being the law permitted abortion and Roe v. Wade being the permitted law of the land as it stands right now. I'm going to start out by reading you uh, a text message that I received um, from uh, someone from a psychologist. Uh, psychologist. Um, you know, the more I think about this abortion law, now I'm not talking about this one, but it's related. I'm talking about Senator Milkovich's bill that was signed by the governor a couple of days ago. You know, the more I think about this abortion law, the more sickened I become. This is a blatant, chauvinistic, woman demoralizing law. To say that even if a man rapes a woman and she gets pregnant, she has to carry his baby. It doesn't matter how sick he is, how reprobate he is, how demoralizing, morally, physically unclean, intellectually deprived that man is, he's a man. And you, woman, therefore, will have his baby. Pro-birth, Senator Morrell. Even if the law chooses to punish the man who raped you, you still have to carry his baby. Just think about that and all of the implications. You know, that creep that no woman wants to even look at. Well, if he decides he wants to have a baby with you, or you, or you, or you, you're going to have his baby. How sick is that? Who are we? Just because you got elected? Now let me continue. This is the epitome of saying that the man is okay and has a voice, whereas the woman can do nothing about it. Furthermore, if your father, brother, uncle, etc. impregnates you, you will have his baby. You will do it. This law sets women back 1,000 years. How sick and disgusting is that? On top of all of this, there are women who are blinded to how this law objectifies women. A female governor signed this bill. This is not simply a matter of women. This is in another state, by the way, a female governor. This is not simply a matter of women being allowed to make choices regarding their own bodies. This is about how the law is strengthening and upholding the power and domination of men. Every woman and man ought to be outraged by this law and what its real implications are. Shame on America, shame on any state, shame on any governor that signs a bill that does not have exceptions for rape and incest. Your religious views are not to be imposed on every citizen of this state. That is not why we got elected. That is not why we are serving in this chamber. To tell a woman like me what to do with my body. My great grandmother, maternal great grandmother was raped and left to die in a lot in New Orleans. I don't know if she was pregnant when they killed her after she was raped. But if she was, I'll be damned. If you are going to tell her that she has to have a child by the rapist. Shame on you. Beyond that, we've decided that, oh, we can take care of that little exception thing later. The bill's implications as it's been amended don't take effect until 2020. Senator Mizell has said, I didn't sign the report because it's 2019 that I wanted the bill in the constitutional amendment to be protected, presented to the public. She also said that it wasn't, it wasn't unimportant, I want to make sure I quote, it wasn't unimportant that the exceptions weren't dealt with. Who are we? What kind of state have we become? President Donald Trump, former President Ronald Reagan, former Governor Buddy Romer, all refused to sign bills and infectuate law that didn't provide for an exception for a woman who has been traumatized by rape. 
But we, in 2019, believe that we should dictate to a woman and young girls, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 years old, the same ones that we've said should be able to get married because they're in love. We dictated marriage to them, and now we're going to say, you're going to have a baby of your rapist, and you're going to raise them. And I don't care about the health care because I haven't put more money for health care. And I don't care about what you do if you have the baby and you can't take care of it because I can't get a job because I'm 12, 13, or 14 years old. I don't care. Those are things we can deal with later, Senator Gaddy, later. Maybe next year. But we got to pass this law right now. The law that doesn't take effect until Roe v. Wade is overturned. But what you heard, remember, multiple times, is we got to do this because other states, other states are doing it. And Peterson, you got a question? Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Walsworth, can you go through these Senate amendments and exactly what they uh, re re removed from the bill? The Senate amendments that I was trying to do on, and on the floor was what was being happening to a uh, basically a patient's record. Uh, even when they had a miscarriage, it was being called uh, a spontaneous abortion. And that word is used throughout uh, the terminology and, and the medical field. Uh, anytime that there is a, uh, no matter what you do, um, whatever happens to the mother or to the baby, if there's a termination, uh, naturally or on purpose, it is an abortion. And we were just going to try to uh, remove that and say that that's a miscarriage and not necessarily abortion. We did have a, a, a lady that came through that said, not only has she had a couple of miscarriages, that now that she's had two miscarriages, she's a, um, I'm trying to remember the words, but it basically a habitual aborter is what it said. And uh, that's on your patient record. A lot of people don't know that that's being used by the medical field. We found out that that's a, a national issue, not necessarily just a state issue. So we removed the... Uh, Floor amendments, uh, it was rejected over on the House side. We've removed those, and now the bill is back where it was when it left the House. Thank you. Um, so you do agree that the bill still um, impacts the ability for a woman, what they refer to as, are you familiar with the term medication abortions? Are you familiar with that term? Uh, somewhat familiar with that term. Okay. So the... So, as I understand it, the purpose of the bill is to require that the medication abortions, to, that they have to be disseminated and dispensed at a facility that is licensed as an outpatient abortion facility, right? So, a, a, a medication abortion, more oftentimes than not, is used early in the pregnancy, right? Right. Okay. And so, for example, with the bills that we now have on the law, let's use the six-week ban, right? Or whether... Right. And it's, it's, let's say six weeks. Yeah. Let's use that that bill. And so let's it's week four and a woman wanted to have an abortion. Typically, the medication version of that, which involves a pill. Right. And they don't have to go to a facility. So this bill would require, even if it's just medication, that they'd have to go to a facility. Are you aware of that? I believe that it is in the. the it is in the law that we're having today, yes. So that's what we're changing. We're requiring it. It's not currently required because a woman wouldn't need to go because it's medication. We, would, we wouldn't have to go. I think when we had the debate on the bill uh, to begin with, uh, it, it, does not, it does not include the morning after pill. The morning after pill is, is not included in the uh, – because the uh, what I understood from the – uh, the debate that we had was there is not uh, there is not a uh, that is not included in this bill at all. The morning after pill can be just taken by the mother uh, immediately after she chooses to uh, maybe the day. I think it's called the morning after pill. So I think that's not included in this legislation. What I understand. 
Okay, so you don't really know much about the morning after pill or this medica medication abortion. I'll go ahead and tell you that's not an expertise that I have. Why are you handling this bill? Because I had the amendment to the, uh, on the bill. And that's what we're rejecting is the amendment to the bill. That's all. Why are you handling a bill about abortion if you don't know about it? Uh, because Representative Hoffman asked me to do it. Put a floor, uh, Senator Peterson. How disrespectful. How disrespectful. You're going to come up here, handle a bill about abortion, but you're going to acknowledge you don't know much about the morning after pill, nor do you know anything about medic medication abortions. Well, why are you handling the bill? Because you're disrespecting women and you really don't care. You want to check a box to say that you're pro-life, but you're really pro-birth, and you want to tell women what they have to do with their bodies, sit at your desk, go back to your districts, and be pro-life. That's it. You're not even worthy of getting educated on what happens to our bodies when we talk to our doctors. How disrespectful. And it's okay because we keep going along and laughing. Let me tell you what the bill does. The purpose of the bill is to require all medication abortions to be dispensed at a facility that is licensed at an outpatient abortion facility. So the bill will limit access, that is the whole purpose of the bill, to limit access to medication abortions to physicians who have also been able to obtain a clinic license. That's what's going on. Right now, under current law, medication abortions can only be dispensed from a physician who is enrolled in or has completed a residency in obstetrics and gynecology or family medicine. There is really no need for this bill to create another level of certification. The intent is to limit access to legal abortions for women to control their bodies, decide what they're going to do with their doctors. I know that's not important to a lot of you. I know there are a lot of conversations going on, but I hope you learn more about it when you get home in October when people have the women show up. When the women show up and tell you how they feel, I hope you listen then.